Good morning. Thank you guys for having me. Like I said, my name is Rebecca. I just started my master's in percussion performance at the University of Missouri, and I did my undergraduate work at a small school called Furman University in South Carolina, where I got degrees in both music and in earth and environmental sciences. Uh, before I decided to pursue music professionally, I wanted to be an environmental educator. I've always been very fascinated with the processes by which people learn about the natural world and about their surroundings. And now that I've decided to pursue music, I think it's my res responsibility, but also my privilege to incorporate this passion of mine for environmental activism into my being as a performer and as a music educator. I sit in the cross section of music and science, and it's such a fun place to sit. I really love to get inside the heads of both of my groups of colleagues and figure out how we can speak the same language and come together to solve the problems that we all face together. So in that vein, I've sort of become enamored with eco-musicology and eco-acoustic music. And during my last year of undergrad, I wanted to do a research project that would unite my academic disciplines. I chose to focus on the large-scale outdoor percussion ensemble work in Uxuit by Pulitzer Prize-winning composer John Luther Adams, who is often known for his works that evoke a certain place or a landscape or have some other sort of environmentalist agenda, if you care to call it that. Um, I was particularly taken by the explicit intent that Adams, or fondly called JLA, uh, states in his performance notes for the work. He says the piece is, quote, intended to expand our awareness of the world in which we live. I wanted to know, is this working? I was wondering if music could serve as an environmental education tool, especially since sound isn't necessarily the first sense that we think about when we're concerned about pollution or deforestation or climate change. As I mentioned, the piece is written specifically for outdoor performance and is described as sight-determined. Every performance is a unique combination of the musician's sounds and the inherent music of the performance space. The term anuxuit is actually the plural of a word you might be familiar with, anukshuk, that is the word for these stone structures that you see here built by the Inuit peoples to indicate their presence in a place. The literal translation of the word is to act in the capacity of the human. So even in the title, um, JLA is making a comment about the uniquely human ability to make a significant and lasting impact on a place where we exist. Believe it or not, this is the score for the piece. JLA calls it the event map, and it really is the best way to visualize what happens in this piece. The work is written for 9 to 99 percussionists who each play one of three parts. And as you can see here, each of the parts has a very specific set of instruments required for each of the five phrases of the piece. The piece usually takes place with about 15-ish minutes per phrase, so it ends up being about 75 minutes total. And it progresses in sort of a domino effect almost. The group one leader begins playing phrase one, and then um, the rest of his group follows suit one by one, and then the group two leader begins phrase one also. So by the time that group two and three have moved to phrase two, group one is already ahead of them in the progression, and the, the piece moves forward in kind of a cascading sort of waterfall of music through the performance space. I've been lucky enough to perform the piece three times now, and I can say that I think it requires a pretty high level of ensemble listening skills, and I often wonder if this piece and others like it can strengthen our listening abilities in ways that uh, traditional concert hall and practice room practices don't necessarily do. JLA continues the imagery of these Anuxuit even in the notation for the, for the piece. I imagine some of you may have seen these before. Um, these are parts given to players in groups two and three and played in the second and fourth phrases of the piece. The second phrase is called Anuxuit Rising, and the player begins by playing the bottom line, just the bottom line, and then all the white space on the page indicates rests. So they play the bottom line, rest a little while, play the bottom two lines, rest a little shorter of a while, and then so on and so forth until they're playing all the lines when they reach the top of the page. The fourth phrase works exactly the opposite way, Anuxuit Falling. They start with all the lines, and then get down to where they've just played the bottom line. 
for me as a performer, these two phrases are often the most moving. Um, the first phrase is very open and airy and tends to blend with the sounds present in the performance space. But next to it, rising is a slap in the face. We are there and we begin to assert our dominance, our power over the sounds that were already present in that place before we were there. And then a next to it falling is kind of a refreshing opposite to that. After 30 minutes or so of loud, just like I said, dominance, um, our sound sort of dies and fades away and it's almost as if we have run our course for that place and have to move on to another one, whether that's on this plane or on a different plane. As you might be able to tell, this piece has had a really profound effect on me, and I wondered if it would have that same sort of impact on an audience. Could it cause them to perceive their environment differently from the way that they did before they experienced this piece? So to find that out, I needed an audience. We needed a performance. So in March of last year, the Furman University Percussion Ensemble performed a Nuxuit. With only 15 players, we were far closer to the nine than to the 99, but I think it was a perfect size for our school and for the, the performance space that we used and for my research project. I recruited 10 people to participate in my study, mostly members of the Furman community, but also people just from the surrounding area. And I asked for, I sort of gathered their response to the performance in two ways. Um, I wanted to know what they had to say about the performance. So I asked them to give me some feedback via one of two apps, either on a university owned iPad using an app called Nevernote, uh, sorry, Evernote, just a standard note taking application, or on their personal smartphones using Twitter with the hashtag Anuxuit. I asked them to respond to a research question that was, please record any thoughts regarding the performance, especially those pertaining to the surrounding environment. Now, I know this question is inherently biased. I struggled a lot with how to get a question that didn't bias their responses. I didn't necessarily feel comfortable just saying, tell me what you think about a Nuxuit, because with such a novel piece of music, um, I thought that I might have gotten such a wide variety of responses that I wouldn't have been able to track any sort of trends in, in anything they were saying. But how to plant the seed in their head of getting them thinking about their surroundings without biasing their results was something I really struggled with. And then I settled on that question, but that's something I'm still working through as I continue working with this research. The other thing I wanted to look at was the movement of the audience during the performance. One of my favorite things about this piece, as some of you might know, is that it really liberates the audience. They don't have to sit in their chair and listen to what they think they're supposed to listen to and then clap when they sort of guess it's over and think they're supposed to clap. They can get up as, and enjoy the piece and experience it as they want to and listen to whatever it is that's attracting them at that moment. So I used another app called RunKeeper um, to keep track of their, of their motion and see where they went during the performance. After all this data gathering, I began to compile and import this data into a GIS, Geographic Information System. Is anybody in the room familiar with GIS? A couple? Okay. Um, GISs are really incredible, incredibly powerful, mind-boggling pieces of mapping software that can handle and organize and visualize data from everything from topographic maps to demographic and statistical information and everything in between. And they can help you create some really meaningful, powerful visualizations of what might be otherwise really hard to understand data. So I began creating a model with just a simple aerial photo of the performance space. And you can see here the, um, the percussionists where the performers were placed. It's become performance practice now for the performers to begin in a central location. So we did do that. And um, these are the spots where they spent, where they got after, the, after that first phrase, after they moved into those places and spent the majority of the rest of the performance in these spots. Based on this initial layer, I created my first composite model to show the movement of the audience. And again, just to reiterate, I'm looking for trends among participants' movements and responses. So I'll play this model for you. And what you'll see is lots of different colored paths. Each different colored path represents a different research participant. And then you'll also see little blue and green dots that show the locations of the comments they submitted. 
and you'll hear a recording, a snippet of the recording from our performance that day. So as you might have been able to see, um, there was a bit of a scavenger hunt mentality going on. Most of the participants ended up um, starting in the middle where the performers were, going out to where some other performer's specific sound was, and then coming back to the center again at the end. But what I found particularly interesting was that the pace at which the participants were moving almost perfectly paralleled the intensity and the volume of the piece. As everything grew, um, they all began to move much more quickly. And then as everything settled down, I guess they settled down too. Again, I'm the most interested in the audience response to the piece and in using these responses to gauge their environmental awareness. Overall, I'm looking at how music can serve as an environmental education tool, really focused on showing a particular person's experience and journey with Anuxuit. So to do that, to, to zoom in on one particular person's experience, I created another model that shows just his path and his comments through the piece. Again, you'll hear a recording from that day, and it's the, the entire length of the performance compressed into about a minute, maybe a little less. So as you saw there, the, the apps that we used allowed us to geolocate the comments that they made, meaning they recorded the um, latitude and the longitude coordinate when that person hit submit or hit tweet. And so I was able to kind of place that layer over the, the layer involving their path and see exactly where they were standing when they said a certain thing. In the future, I'd like to create these models for several people at lots of different performances of Anuxuit, aiming to model both their physical and their sonic experience and to see if certain circumstances are eliciting certain responses or certain changes in awareness or perception. To organize all the comments and, and sort of sort through those people's responses, I used a piece of software called Deduce, which is pretty common for qualitative analysis. Um, you can see there on the left side the list of codes that I used that are just the most commonly mentioned topics in all the comments that I received. And Deduce helped me create lots of different visualizations and sort of categorize and organize that data in order to draw conclusions from what I got. The visualization that I found to be the most, the easiest, the most clear was just a simple word cloud or point cloud where the most commonly mentioned topic appears the largest. And as you can see here, the most common topic was relationship, specifically that between man-made sound and natural sound. This was unusual and really exciting for me because I think that um, when we think about environment, or at least when I think about environmental activism, I'm often overwhelmed visually with graphic images of glaciers melting or polar bears or huge machines chopping down swaths of rainforest. But clearly, 
this piece was getting our audience to think about the performance in terms of sound. I think that's a skill that we as musicians hopefully have already learned to strengthen and use ourselves to our advantage, but hearing about how these people were hearing or reading about how they were hearing this performance and also the place in which was in which it was being played was really really exciting because it showed me that yes and next to it was was doing its job it was getting these people to think about their surroundings in a new and and different way that indicated a heightened awareness of that space this is a, a list of, uh, just a sample of some of the comments that I got. And one of my favorite ones is there at the top, discovering trails and passages I never knew existed. And this was particularly important to me because most of the members of, most of the participants in my study were members of the Furman community, meaning they lived or worked on campus and spent a great deal of time there. But by virtue of attending this performance, they were being shown a part of that campus that they d had never seen before. And I think that speaks volumes for this piece and for other pieces with non-traditional performance practices and what we can learn from them that we might not learn in a normal concert hall setting. A perspective not really fully accounted for here is what I like to call the innocent bystander perspective. I think at any given performance of a Nuxuit, there are probably twice as many people who don't intend to be there as do intend to be there. And their perspective and opinion is often really entertaining, but also I think really important since they don't have that bias that I mentioned earlier. Unfortunately, getting their perspective into my data set is a little difficult because of um, parameters and rules that come from the Institutional Review Board from the IRB. When people participate in a research study, they have to give informed consent and they have to acknowledge that they're participating in the study. And so to get that innocent bystander perspective was a little difficult. I recently attended a performance of Anuxuit with Third Coast Percussion in South Bend, Indiana, and they had a huge crew of volunteers who were there specifically to answer questions from the audience and also to sort of protect the performers a little bit from being asked those questions as they were playing. But I think that's a really great idea and hopefully in the future I'll be able to use that, um, use those, use a crew like that of volunteers to get that bystander perspective like I mentioned. But at our performance we just did not have the personnel for that. I did get a sort of a hint of this bystander perspective when one of our performers was asked if we were invoking evil spirits or warning of a Russian invasion. <laughs> uh, one of our performers, like I said, was asked that and then she tweeted that to me with hashtag Anuxuit, so that's how I got that comment. But we did spend a lot of time wondering what they were thinking. <laughs> Earlier I mentioned wanting to model also the sonic experience of someone at a, at a performance of Anuxuit. So to do that, I began experimenting with a tool called Spread GIS. This stands for a system for the prediction of acoustic detectability within a GIS. And what it allows you to do is plot a point, assign a decibel value to the sound coming from that point, and then it approximates and creates a model that looks like this of how a, that particular sound will travel through a space based on a set of environmental parameters that you plug in. So things like humidity and temperature, wind speed and direction, land cover, you know, vegetation type, that kind of thing. So I created this sound model that I'll um, animate for you here in a second. You can see the performers are color coded according to instrument group with the, that concentric circle formation that JLA calls for in the score. Um, and like I said, I'll animate this for you just so you can better orient yourself. Maybe. There we go. So as you might expect, on the, the top end of the map, the north end, the sound's not traveling nearly as far in that forested area, not, not projecting as well as it is um, over the water. And I, something else I thought about trying to include in this type of sound map was the motion of the performers. Um, because like I said, they, they do move from one place to another and I would have loved to see how their sound changes as they move between different spaces. But 
that would have gotten very complicated very quickly, and I really did want to maintain my focus on the audience and their experience. I think you can make a whole separate project about just sound mapping and the performers for that. Um, and actually, I did talk with John Luther Adams a little bit about that. Um, he, right when he finished writing Sela, I got to meet him and discuss this research with him. And so he was particularly interested in this type of tool for performer placement for works like Anaxua and Sela and trying to figure out um, how best to lay out those types of performances using tools like this. I think it allows you to take a perspective that we sort of assume when we think about a concert hall. Of course, we walk into a hall or a space like this and we wonder how our instruments are going to sound in that space. But when we go to plan a performance of Anuxuit, perhaps, we're thinking a little more visually about, hey, that drummer looks really pretty over by that waterfall, <laughs> or things like that. And I think it allows us to take that concert hall perspective out into a new setting. As those of us, um, any of us who have participated in Anuxuit before know, it's not just the instrumentalist sound that is important to the piece, though. The ambient soundscape is at least equally as important, if not more so. And I really wanted to find a way to capture that. I just happened upon an app called NoiseTube that pairs a decibel meter with a GPS locator, and it creates a model that looks like this when you use it on your smartphone. So we tested it out on performance day, and as you might guess, um, the darker circles that, that indicate the higher level, you can see as the person with the app approaches performers, the sound is getting louder, and as they move away from them, it's getting softer. The app was designed for participatory noise pollution monitoring and was developed at a university in Brussels. Unfortunately, it was not nearly as reliable as I would have liked. This map worked really well on my Android smartphone, but we had a lot of trouble getting it to work on iPhones. And then as I was doing the troubleshooting process and trying to figure out how to make it work better, I couldn't find anything from the authors for a, that wasn't like two years old. So I'm thinking that it's probably an inactive project now which was a little disappointing. I think if all of our participants had been able to use this app, we could have created a really individualized you know, model for each person. But unfortunately, like I said, probably an inactive project at this point. As fun as creating these sound maps and everything has been for me, um, it's really not the greater purpose here. The greater purpose is to show as many angles of an audience member's experience as possible. In combining all these layers of data, what I'm really searching for is a way to retell the story of someone's journey with and through Anuxuit and how that journey might alter their perception of their surroundings and of the natural world at large. What I'm finding is that, yes, Anuxuit is doing just that. It is expanding our awareness of the world in which we live based on what these people said about the relationship between natural and man-made sound. In the future, I hope to repeat this process at, like I said, lots of different performances of Anuxuit and also to find other applications for this type of modeling and research. It's been a, a really, really fun interdisciplinary adventure that certainly wouldn't have been possible without my wonderful faculty at Furman University and without the support of the University of Missouri School of Music. So I have them to thank, and I have you all to thank for coming today and for listening to what I have to say, because in the end, what I'm the most curious about is how we listen and what we learn from it. Thank you. <laughs>